talk you through a little bit of what the Joint uh, Committee for Surgical Training and the GMC have for their expectations for trainees, general trainees to have uh, in andrology. I also want to talk to you about a survey that we did um, where we um, contacted most of the trainees throughout the UK and their views on how they were getting their trainee, what problems they were having, um, and then potentially a few, um, a few solutions that, that we might have um, towards the, the problems. So currently there's 323 trainees across the UK are registered with the ISCP, 284 registered with BAUS. And what we want to know is what do the trainees need to do um, during their five or six year training uh, to complete their andrology training? And what should a general urology consultant be confident to do? And how many andrologists do the UK need? So indicative numbers, this often fills trainees with quite a lot of dread. This is the level of um, operations or the number of operations that trainees need to get their certification. I'm going to go straight to the andrology. Uh, so over the course of the five year training, they only need to get 20 procedures, and that is uh, with penile cancer surgery, peronies, as well as um, emergency, so priapisms and fractures. Um, I'm going to just talk you through the competence levels because I discussed it a few times through the talk, but basically the competence levels that they need to be able to do is one, so they've watched it. Two, they've done it next to the consultant who's assisted them if they've had problems. Three, they can do most of the procedure, but they might need some help. And four, they should be happy to do the whole procedure as well as the complications. So the curriculum is broken up into intermediate level as well as senior level. So the intermediate level, that's the SD3 to SD6 trainees, and this is basically working up for your FRCS urology. That knowledge is then examined in the FRCS role as well as being assessed in uh, the work-based assessments. In their final stage overview, this is when they should be becoming really competent to manage just the general urology conditions, including starting to subspecialize. Trainees can then go on to do um, one or two specialist areas of training, and the amount that they do depends on the aptitude of the trainee, as well as the, how big that actual subspecialty, um, subspecialist area is. So at the point of CCT, what andrology procedures do they need to have proved and they can do? So they're all at a level two, so they can do it standing next to their consultant. And that's a Nesbitt's procedure, as well as the emergency and trauma procedures and management of a varicocele. Those trainees who then decide to go on to do andrology subspeciality, the curriculum is then further increased, and this gives you a brief idea of the sort of operations they're expected to do and the levels um, of the training that they need to do. So again, only circumcision that they should be able to do by themselves, uh, the rest with assistance of a, a consultant, and when you're going on to the groins, um, they just need to be able to assist. Interestingly, if you look at male factor infertility, that level that they need to be able to reach is much higher. And I would say that's quite surprising as there's so few units where they can get that experience. When it comes to erectile dysfunction, so we're talking about implants, so um, malleable implants being more comfortable and inflatable that they'll do with their consultant. I would say the other um, techniques um, on the curriculum are, are fairly rare and not something we, we use particularly often. And penile deformity, I think uh, Nesbitt's procedure, this is fairly often straddled by the general urologist and the andrologist, and it's got a higher level of competency at three, and then going down to the implants. And then we're talking about trauma, and that's so in the DGHs, the penile fractures, the priapisms can be looked after, and going up onto the malleable implant. So how did we assess it? I sent out a survey monkey via BAUS to all of the trainees, and that was 284 in the BAUS uh, database. Um, we, asked, we, we said that they would uh, potentially win a free day's registration at BAUS to try and increase the numbers. We had a fairly poor response. Um, I then uh, bothered everyone I knew, and I'm grateful for all the TPDs that helped with this, um, and also the surge group, and we picked the numbers up to 122, but still less than half the trainees. So very briefly, this um, chart just shows you um, where the different uh, um, trainees um, answered the questions from, so no answers from Ireland, good answers from around London and the areas surrounding London, and that might be because I've got good access to those trainees. What year of training were they? So um, over 60% were either in the intermediate stage or post-CCT. 40% had worked in an andrology unit, which is good. And I think this for me was the most surprising uh, result of the question. So in in regards to the curriculum and how confident they were in just managing the patients, um, erectile dysfunction was the first question. And actually, you can see sort of well over 40% of trainees w were, were not confident, slightly confident or somewhat confident in managing erectile dysfunction. 
And I would think of this as kind of bread and butter general urology, not specifically andrology. Obviously, when you, once you start going towards the implants, but the general management, um, I would hope most trainees would be quite comfortable in managing by themselves. Infertility, ejaculatory disorders, so no big surprises. They're not madly confident uh, um, managing these patients. And again, not many units out there dealing uh, with infertility. Penile curvature was one of the uh, surgical procedures they're most uh, happy managing, with 40% uh, being quite confident. I'm going to take the next two slides together, and that's uh, ischemic priapism and penile fracture. And I was quite surprised because... As they've mentioned before, the number of procedures that the trainee will see um, fixing both ischemic priapism and penile fracture, I've spoken to the SAC, and uh, during the course of the training, most trainees will see three to five of these cases during the whole of their training. And yet, this is one of the ones that they were most confident in managing. Pre-malignant and malignant conditions of the penis are sort of variously distributed over all those answers. And benign male genital dermatosis, not happy with looking after that. And I would say that quite often these patients are probably going into penile dermatology um, rather than neurology clinics. So most importantly now, so across the whole of the, the country, how easy was it to access your andrology training? 40% um, found it really difficult and 37% they had to put some extra effort in to get their numbers. I've split this up, um, just looking at it a little bit um, closer, and the numbers are small, but basically the red um, chart shows the number of uh, trainees in that region which answered the question, and the pink shows the number who, in that region who found that it was difficult to access. And so just highlighting a few of the ones that have come up um, proportionally high, so that's North Central Thames, the North West, North West London, Wales, um, and the West Midlands and Yorkshire. How confident were they that they were going to be able to get to, to be involved in 20 andrology procedures? And 20 andrology, maybe you say, is not that many. 40% uh, had already achieved it, but if you're going to the unsure down to unlikely, you definitely won't achieve. That was almost 40%, again, weren't sure that they were going to be able to get their indicative numbers. Again, that's just assisting, it's not doing. 15% thought that they might subspecialize in andrology out of the, the people who have answered. So, in results, I'm not particularly surprised by the penile dermatosis, the ejaculatory disorders, and the infertility. I thought that was probably going to come up as the one that they weren't happy managing. The lack of confidence in treating erectile dysfunction, I was surprised at. And I think that's probably because it's being looked after by the GPs, and when it then needs to go to hospital, it's going to the nurse-led clinics. And as I said, surprisingly, they're most confident in treating emergency procedures, which are quite rare. Now, we know that the emergency procedures come up in the examination. You have to be very slick at being able to talk through uh, the management of both priapism and fractures. And it might be that they, have, they feel quite confident to do it. But in reality, I'm not 100% sure how confident they are. As a tertiary center where we get a lot of calls in and a lot of uh, referrals, I would say we see a, a large proportion of men, particularly with priapism, who are coming to us without having even gone through the first line of management. So clinically, whether that's true, I, 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 it doesn't feel like it from our center. So, training versus service provision. So, 41% of uh, trainees didn't feel they were going to get the indicative numbers. They're worried they're not going to, but actually, at the end of the day, they all do. Last year, all of the trainees managed to get their andrology numbers apart from one. And whose responsibility is it to get their numbers? Is it down to the trainee? Is it down to the deanery? It's actually down to the TPD, and what the TPDs are now doing is checklists at SD4 and SD6. And if they can see that a trainee is not reaching their numbers, they should be moved to a, a different hospital where they're going to be able to reach the numbers. And that's not just for andrology, that's across the board for female um, and oncology. What I find quite interesting with that graph where we split up who was finding it difficult to access, the majority of trainees were actually very close to UCLH. And so ge geographically, they're close to the units where they can get their, their training. It's just not within their units, so they need to be able to get into these tertiary referral units. Um, the workforce, Mike Palmer's really kindly given me some of his interim numbers. Um, they're looking at the workforce survey at the moment, and I'll um, stress that it's not closed. They've had 504 responses so far, and 81 uh, consultants felt that they had a subspeciality interest in andrology, with 121 are regularly performing um, Nesbitt's procedure. 36 are inserting penile um, prosthesis, um, although that differs ever so slightly from the, the penile implant uh, database so far. 
Uh, ASAP's gone into this into quite a lot of detail, but what I wanted to know is how many andrologists do we need at the end of the day? Will the cl clinical commissioning mean that we have increased numbers of andrologists needed around the country, with lots of men now saying, well, I'm eligible for a penile implant, or I'm eligible for a sperm retrieval? But actually, the reality is the funding requests are going up, the approval rates are going down, and the lecture of surgery futs are, um, cuts are going down as well. So we're going to be seeing less and less andrology procedures being carried out. So what's the best way to train the general urologists uh, in andrology? So the surgical passport is an idea that's been around for a little while, and it just means that the trainee can actually have a little bit of a movement around their deanery. They're not stuck in their hospital. So they have a passport which carries their occupational health, their security clearance, and it means they can move a little bit more. I think the hope is, is that uh, trainees will then be able to use zero days, afternoons off, and their leave time to go and see the procedures. What I actually think would be much better is in your year of training, you're actually given a month off your service provision to go into a tertiary service, where you can then absolutely surround yourself in the surgery and the clinics, and you can get a much better basis of training in all those subspeciality um, subjects. That's happening at the moment for paediatrics, and there's now a 40-day enforced training that everyone's needing to do for the peds. This is versus the national fellowships, and this obviously isn't for general urology trainees, but people who want to subspecialize uh, in andrology. The SAC calculated back in 2009 that we only needed probably about one andrology fellow per year coming out at the top to provide the service required for the consultants. Uh, they're hoping that we'll have government funding um, fellowship at some point within the next few years. So how do we do the training? I feel very strongly about the fact that a lot of people will come, particularly to UCH, and they'll say, can I come and do the operation? Can we come and assist you? Not one person has ever come and said, can I come and sit in clinic with you? Can I come and listen to how you counsel the patients? Andrology is full of quite difficult um, and very complex patients, and I think the time that you spend with them in the clinic beforehand and their complications and their unhappiness after is much more important, particularly for the general urologist. You need to be able to see them so you can see who needs to be referred and try to sort of manage their expectations when it comes to andrology. The infertility centers that are around, the gynae ridges are in there already. We need to get the urology um, trainees in there as well. Surgical follow-ups and clinics, funding is difficult and I know it's not available, but I think if, if trainees could see their patients, particularly simple things such as circumcision, so you see what's the patient unhappy with, what don't they like after the operation, that's the most important learning curve for the trainees. So the curriculum is currently being rewritten and the indicative numbers are likely to change for andrology in the next couple of years. As I mentioned, the enforced day um, paediatric 40-day training, that's more service provision. They have to get the DGH consultants able to look after the torsion children and provide a service. That's not true for andrology and, uh, and female. So in conclusion, um, yes, I think the trainees need more experience and there's certain areas uh, that, that definitely uh, can provide it. We need to have better access getting into the tertiary centers and I think the passports might uh, make that easier. I also think the easier movement between the, uh, the tertiary center and the DGH will allow for better education. And as I said, one national fellow is apparently enough at the moment. Thank you. Any questions? Just while I get a note to ask you some questions, do you think 20 cases is enough? Considering vasectomy is one of those uh, no, areas? I don't. Um, I know um, I was um, a little bit nervous about some of the indicative numbers, not for andrology, but from some of the other specialities, just because we didn't have access to it. But I think once you're there doing the operations, things like the emergency surgery, the vasectomies, I don't think 20 is enough. And, and I think the indicative numbers will change as the curriculum changes next year. The trend is fellowships in andrology. I mean, all the main groups, all the main sort of centers are, are sort of concentrating on that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's to the detriment of training our registrars? Because certainly in our institution, as soon as we say we'll have a fellow, my colleagues say, oh, we'll take your registrar then. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a, an element of that, but I think rather than just taking in your fellows at tertiary centers, we should have access for normal trainees to come in and sit in the clinics. I think that would be really important. Not carry out their own clinic, but to be sitting with someone like yourself where you can learn how you manage the patient. I think that's much more important for a general urologist. Okay. Can I just ask you, I, I was quite impressed with the surgical passport thing. It's probably going on without my, because uh, I'm very ignorant, but... Uh, 
uh, are the deaneries taking on board this, uh, this really good approach? I've spoken to Roland Morley about the surgical passport, and he was the one that mentioned it. In terms of taking a month out of your year's placement, uh, he thought there would be no way they could do that because the urologists or the registrars provide such a service provision. But I actually think it would be such a better idea, rather than just coming and watching one Nesbitt's procedure one week, maybe doing a penile fracture three or four weeks later, you can get a better grasp of your training.